This conference will now be this conference share. will now be recorded. Okay, we will go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us. I'm Jack Johnson, Vice President of the of Americas and Global for the Fabry International Network. And on behalf of Finn, I am happy to welcome you to the presentation of highlights from the World Symposium 2022. The World Symposium. Uh, conference took place from February 7th to the 11th, where the latest information on basic science, translational science, and clinical trials for lysosomal diseases was shared. Our speaker for today is Dr. Robert Hopkin. He is a, an associate professor of clinical pediatrics at the Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center within the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. The majority of Dr. Hopkins time is spent in caring for patients with genetic disorders. He participates in clinics from fetal care to adult genetics. Uh, he has participated in natural history studies on Fabry disease, as well as a number of clinical trials. He, um, has, uh, he is sharing with us a summary of Fabry related topics that were presented at the World Symposium. This meeting will be recorded and made available later on the FIN website and YouTube channel. Uh, we ask that during the presentation, you keep your microphone muted and your camera off. Questions may be asked at the end of the presentation and you can use the raise your hand function in GoToMeeting or via the chat function. So thank you everybody for joining us and I turn it over to Dr. Hopkins. Uh, what screen are you guys seeing? Because I cannot tell. Beautiful blue sky. Okay, that is not the one that I need. I don't, let's see, how do I change this? So Dr. Hopkin, you might want to open the PowerPoint slide first and then click on share screen. Yeah, I, I have Maybe the PowerPoint yeah. slide open. Mm -hmm. now, let me just put it over here. Uh, maybe it only shares one of your screens. Maybe that's why. Okay. Huh. It is not allowing me to open in this view. Um, from where you are, Dr. Hopkin, you could try maximizing your screen and presenting uh, from it there. I can, yeah, I can just do this. And yeah, I'm sorry that I could not get the slide presentation function to work, but we will go with this. I think you should be able to um, see it. So what I am going to present is first an overview of sort of how much content there was about February disease at the World Symposium, and then some of the things that I thought were most clinically relevant, and then go through uh, some of the abstracts. Now, the way that I selected things had some to do with how much interest I had in them, but also some to do with how accessible the data was um, for the various abstracts and presentations because some of them it was very difficult to go back and if I didn't trust my notes, I kind of minimized those. Uh, it is also really important to note that there was a lot of stuff presented at the world meeting about February disease and this is only going to be a fairly small section of that just because of time. 
So overall, there were more than 60 presentations on Pebre disease, including four satellite symposiums. Those were 90 minutes in length, and we'll talk more about some of them in a few minutes. There were multiple uh, pharmaceutical companies um, and genetic testing companies that had booths and information available on Prebre disease. I am not going to talk about any of that because I think all of that is available through other sources. Uh, some of the hot topics that were just sort of broadly covered at the meeting included newborn screening, um, and that included newborn screening for Febre disease, but is Febre disease was not the key topic for any of the uh, newborn screening um, abstracts. Gene therapy was the biggest single topic, and there were some several um, presentations specifically on gene therapy for Febre disease, uh, and we will talk about some of those. There were also a number of um, groups that had uh, some interest in gene therapy and side conversations were going on with gene therapy on Febre disease, but without presentations, I will not be going into um, all of those. Uh, and then there was a great deal of discussion on um, clinical care and long-term outcomes versus clinical trials, and that was done in multiple different settings. And again, we will be talking about some of that. So the satellite uh, sim symposiums were um, all four of the ones that were dedicated to Febre disease, significantly focused on females. Three of them were specifically and mostly focused on women with Febre disease, and those included uh, discussion on when to treat uh, women with Febre disease compared to men with Febre disease and contrasting heart and kidney pathology. Uh, women with Febre disease ignoring the men and comparing women from the with febre disease to women in the general population and looking at the differences in health risks uh, compared to that and then clinical clinical trials versus clinical care was a, a symposium also so in the discussion of when to treat uh, this focused mostly on when, on questions surrounding when to treat women and when to treat children with Febre disease. And the bottom line on all of it was anybody who is symptomatic, meaning if they have a health problem that is attributed to Febre disease, they're a good candidate for treatment and should be offered treatment. For women specifically, it was noted that left ventricular hypertrophy is seen before heart failure, and heart failure is the leading cause of death in Febre disease, um, and it's even more common as a cause of death in men. So anybody who has left ventricular hypertrophy um, should be offered treatment. And that is detected either with echocardiograms or cardiac MRI. Sometimes ECG uh, will also detect um, left ventricular hypertrophy. And the speaker really emphasized the um, importance of routinely getting um, those studies uh, done. Now, there's a difference in the timing for when, how often you should do um, heart imaging studies. In pediatric patients, we do it at baseline and then at age 15. 
then five years later, and then after that, it you go into the adult care world, and the recommendations are quite varied. Some people recommend doing cardiac imaging every year. Other people will start off with doing it every two to three years. And then if they detect changes in heart function or in the thickness of the cardiac wall, they will increase the frequency to annually. Occasionally, if somebody has um, a lot of concerns about their heart and they're making a lot of changes in management, um, echoes and cardiac MRIs may, be, may need to be done more than once per year. So that one was a key uh, focus. Um, that same talk also talked about stroke. And there were some things that confused me. So there was a slide that said uh, stroke is four times as common in people with febrile disease as it is in the general population. But then there was another slide that stated that at for the ages from 39 to 46, that for women, with febre disease, stroke was 600-fold what it is for the general population, and for men, up to 2,000 times. That is a lot of risk. Now, there might have been some typos in those slides. I am not sure. Um, I was not able to go and ask the speaker that specifically. But I think the bottom line is that it's much higher risk than the general population. Now, for stroke, they're unlike heart disease, you don't see small changes first. So what you know is in, an, in adulthood, there's an increased risk for stroke, and it's substantially higher than the general population risk but still most of the people with febrile disease do not get strokes. The uh, long-term stroke risk for men, I think, is close to 7%, and women is just over 4%, um, which is still quite high for something that can be uh, can lead to permanent uh, loss of function or even to early death. So if you have any kinds of uh, cerebrovascular symptoms, so if you have TIAs and you have febre disease, you should definitely be on treatment at that point. Um, now, there are people who claim that, well, we'll talk about that later. I'll get back to stroke risk for in a couple of slides. Um, the other thing for women and that that was emphasized as a late stage uh, was that kidney disease reaching end stage, meaning dialysis or kidney transplant, is 11 times as common in women with febre disease as it is in the general pop population, that's quite a high risk. So if you have signs of kidney disease, you want to take that seriously. The other thing that was not covered in that talk, but that is important, is if you have, if a woman with febre disease has, um, proteinuria, that correlates with the risk for progression of heart disease in addition to um, the risk for uh, end-stage kidney disease. So for both of those reasons, proteinuria should be considered a strong indication for starting therapy. Now, one of the things that was emphasized in this in this satellite symposium was that it is best when possible to treat 
before the person is feeling symptoms. So in medical jargon, symptoms are not just findings of disease, symptoms are things that the patient notices. So before you feel chest pain or fatigue or abdominal pain or you have decreased exercise tolerance because of heart failure, you want to start treatment. You want to notice this with things that our monitoring protocols can detect, but not wait until you have some kind of organ dysfunction or discomfort. Um, for children, the first symptoms, even if they're mild, are considered adequate reason to start treatment, even when children are quite young. Um, there's data looking at that down to age five, and there are certainly children who have symptoms before age five, and that is still considered a time for treatment. Treatment has been looked at from a safety standpoint down to age two, and so treatment for Febre disease, depending on which kind of treatment you're wanting to do, um, can be used in children as young as age two. Uh, treatment for women uh, before severe heart damage is essential if we want to get good outcomes. So the next symposium was the one on women with Fabry disease that the part of the basis of the of the talk was that we would just ignore that men exist and talk about women with Fabry disease and compare them to both women in the general population and women um, who have other chronic diseases. And the reason that that was done was because there's a tendency to look at men with febre disease and women with febre disease and note that the women ha uh, that the men tend to have earlier onset and more rapid progression and that leads a lot of people to conclude that febre disease isn't a big deal in women that it's just febre light and so this this symposium was designed to sort of confront that issue. And uh, so they, this summary in one slide for this symposium, it's about half of women with Febre disease will have a serious, meaning potentially life-threatening event before age 65. About 70% of females with Febre disease are symptomatic and 43%, even before age 65, 43% of adult females with febrile disease have what are considered severe and serious symptoms of febrile disease. So of women with febrile disease, greater than 50% will um, die if they die early, will die related to cardiac disease. So similar to the last talk that I was describing, about 60% of females were presented as having heart disease. The typical age of that diagnosis being made, so Fabre-related heart disease, is age 56. There are some signs of heart change well before that in many women with slowing of the heart being the first finding and that one often starts in adolescence. Um, to compare that to the general population, about 22% of women in the general population have a diagnosis of heart, active heart disease and the average age for that diagnosis to be made is 72. Women with diabetes, about 16% have 
have a diagnosis of active heart disease and the age of that that diagnosis is 63. So both of those, the heart disease is milder and later onset than it is in women with Fabry disease. The next thing that was covered was stroke and cerebrovascular disease. About a quarter of women in the Fabry registry have had um, some kind of a cerebrovascular event, meaning either a transient ischemic attack or TIA or a stroke. The average age of first stroke in women who have had a stroke was a, approaching age 40. It was a little bit younger than that, as you can see on the slide. Compare that to the general population where only about two and a half percent have a stroke, and the average age of first stroke is 75. So there is clearly a difference between people, women with Fabry disease and the general population. Now, kidney disease um, was reported active kidney disease, meaning beyond stage one. Uh, was reported in a relatively smaller amount, only 4%. Uh, typical age of first diagnosis was age 38. That is compared, however, 4%, which I said, not as high as stroke and not as high as heart disease, at least in the data sets that were used in this talk. But that's compared to two in a thousand in the general population. So that's 0.2%. So there's a big difference between the general population and women with Fabry disease. Now, not everybody with Fabry disease is having life-threatening events like kidney failure or stroke or um, uh, life-threatening heart disease. So let's talk a little bit about the other symptoms. So GI disease, meaning um, abdominal pain, diarrhea, constipation, nausea, and sometimes other kinds of things are seen in about 45% of, of uh, women with Fabry disease. And incidentally, the GI symptoms are almost the same for men. Um, in the general population, it's about 25%. So the difference between people with Fabry disease for GI symptoms isn't as big, but there are some differences in what kind of complaints they have. Diarrhea as a chronic recurrent problem is much more frequent with Fabry disease than it is in the general population, whereas abdominal pain is only modestly increased over the general population. In pediatric patients, in pediatric females, neuropathic pain was reported in about 45% or 4.5%, 40.5%, sorry, I am tripping over my tongue, um, versus 5% of um, pediatric females in the general population having hand and foot pain. Um, in adults, it's significantly higher, 77% uh, for Fabry disease and around 20% for the general population. The pain in Fabry disease was comparable to rheumatoid arthritis and, uh, and MS. And those are conditions that everybody considers to be important. Now, some aspects of the pain of rheumatoid arthritis are more severe than 
um, what is reported in Fabry disease, but by the if you look at sort of a broad spectrum of uh, ways of looking at pain, there is a substantial overlap with both uh, rheumatoid arthritis and MS. Quality of life for women with Fabry disease is again comparable to some of the other chronic diseases and substantially lower um, in women with Fabry disease than it is in the general population. Now, interestingly, if you look at quality of life measures um, in late adolescence and early adulthood, men are already having much lower quality of life, medical quality of life than women at that age. I mean, then the general population at that age. Women at age 18 to 20 are only mildly different than the general population, but by the time they hit age 40, the quality of life, the health-related quality of life for men and women with Fabry disease is just about equal. So the conclusion of this is that women with Fabry disease have a very significant um, burden of disease that should not be considered to be a mild condition and should be taken seriously. That the idea that we should hold off on treatment of women is just not supported by the data that we have. Um, now, there were two on the when to treat women, so uh, there, I'm not going to talk about four different symposiums. Um, but this last one was um, clinical trials versus clinical care, and there were a couple of things that were pointed out that I think are important. One is clinical trials are almost by definition relatively short. Um, typically a six month tr active treatment period, the longest ones, the longest clinical trials to date have had a two years of active treatment um, that was com with a comparator group. And then they go into an extended treatment stage that's open label. Um, because it makes it very complicated to do the analysis, clinical trials will almost always exclude people with coexisting conditions like hypertension or diabetes or any kind of history of cancer or who have advanced disease and have required a kidney transplant or a pacemaker to be implanted or something like that. Um, the focus of clinical trials is to get a product approved so that it can be used to treat the patients. And we want that to be successful. And the focus on the clinical trials is really almost exclusively on the primary and secondary endpoints of the trial. They do not look broadly at all of the symptoms of Fabry disease because, again, that complicates the analysis of the data and makes it harder to be convincing and harder to meet the endpoints that the FDA is looking for. Now, in contrast, clinical care is not short term. Most people, as was mentioned earlier, will have symptoms, some signs and symptoms of Fabry disease starting in childhood and will have significant burden of disease going into it even early adulthood. Um, ideally, we would like to start treatment before there are symptoms and by definition, when we're treating people with medications for Fabry disease, we want to look at the whole scope of the disease, 
not just one aspect of it. It makes no sense to treat somebody's heart disease, but ignore their kidney disease. So because of that, the focus in clinical care is a little bit different. The other thing that's unique or that differentiates the two is that you cannot exclude people from treatment because they have comorbidities. So if somebody has diabetes or arthritis or hypertension or other chronic disease, we can't just say, oh, then we're going to ignore your Febre disease. So we need to put those patients in and, and look at them. One of the things that was emphasized in this symposium was that you must include treatment for both the Febre disease and the comorbidities to be successful. So if you have a patient who has diabetes and Febre disease, they need to have good control of both if we're going to successfully protect their health. And I have had that kind of a discussion at least four times in the last three months. So it's not rare to have two things going on at once, especially as patients get, as people with Febre disease get older, we're going to have people with complex care needs. That means that we cannot rely only on the data from the clinical trials to guide what's best care for Febre disease. We need to look at sort of the real life setting and look at the data that's from the clinical trials. We need to create a system for tracking outcomes that accounts for multiple decades of treatment being needed and that looks at change over that kind of a period of time in addition to looking at short-term responses. Um, there was a good discussion as part of that um, symposium and I think that it is worth watching. I don't know if it's going to be made available uh, to people who did not attend this symposium, the world meeting. Now we're going to talk about some of the things that were more focused treatment. So one of them is the chaperone drug. Um, now I only picked one of the things that was presented on the, the chaperone uh, treatment for Febre disease. But um, right now in the US, uh, megalostat is only approved for treatment in people 18 years and older. And in Europe, I think it's approved for people 16 and older. But there is a clinical trial that is just wrapping up now. It has not been published, but this data, um, but it was some data was presented by Dr. Ramaswamy. And basically, we looked at a population of um, adolescents and did peaks and troughs of drug levels, looked at um, biomarkers like GB3 and LysoGB3, looked at uh, levels of enzyme production within the cells of their body. And this was a preliminary look at some of that data. And the main focus was safety, but they showed basically that using the same dosing as we do for the adults was safe and effective in uh, pediatric patients between age 12 and 18. There were no serious safety events. There was some increase in headaches and cold-like symptoms and some increase in UTI-like symptoms that was transient. Uh, the 
efficacy is still being analyzed and was not included in the presentation. Uh, now, I did not pull the, the author's name or um, a title, but there were also um, a couple of abstracts focusing on um, adult treatment with megalostat. And basically what they showed was that for both kidney and heart disease, the benefits that were found in the early, in the clinical trials, meaning people who were on treatment for six months to two years, has now been followed out in a population of patients to about five years and the benefits appear to be stable. Now, megalostat has to be used only in people who have mutations that have been shown to be responsive to it. Um, so it's only good for the patients who have um, Fabry disease secondary to mutations or changes in the GLA gene that um, allow some enzyme to be produced. It can still be classical Fabry disease, or it can be later onset Fabry disease. The STAR trial is a gene therapy trial that uses an AAV vector. Uh, they did a presentation on six patients, two of whom had just been dosed. So we didn't have a lot of data on them, but important findings from this very preliminary study. There were no significant safety concerns reported. All of the patients have tolerated the treatment well. Um, the first four patients have been shown to be making some enzyme, all of them at higher than normal blood levels of enzyme. Uh, but we don't know how widely that's distributed, and we haven't had enough yet to analyze impact on health, enough time. Um, there was only one patient who really was not receiving any treatment prior to getting the gene therapy. That patient showed um, I, about a fourfold the sort of normal physiologic level of blood enzyme and um, had a drop in lysoGB3 down to a, about half of what it was prior to um, being treated. Um, we do not have data on what that's doing for heart or kidney health at this point. And we, they did not all present any data on uh, pain and energy levels either. The other three patients for which there was some follow-up data on um, were on treatment at the time that they were first treated. One of them has been taken off of ERT and is making uh, enzyme, they did not have enough time of follow-up to present um, the lysoGB3 or, or other GB3 levels uh, on them yet. And the other two are planning to come off of ERT uh, in the coming months, but have not yet done so. The results are encouraging and were strong enough uh, that the um, study is now going into a next phase uh, for treatment. Another gene therapy trial done by a different group of people, also using AAV-based gene therapy, was the MARVEL-1 trial. That study had enrolled two patients. Uh, one of them had a mild increase in liver enzymes in one of the patients and a mild uh, carditis in both of the patients treated. Neither of them required treatment. They just saw some 
cardiac biomarkers go up, the safety and level of enzyme expression were thought to be quite good, and the first two patients were enough to go ahead and start uh, preparing for the next phase of the trial in which they will escalate um, the gene therapy dosage and, and also monitor for um, both efficacy and any kinds of side effects that might occur. Now, both of those two trials targeted primarily liver as the uh, place where the enzyme would be um, expressed. This next one is uh, gene therapy that the vector chosen was chosen because it has increased uptake in the heart and kidneys. It is also taken up in the liver, so you get more organs producing the enzyme, and they have treated three patients. Safety appeared to be good. Uh, there was one patient that did have a uh, hemolytic uremic syndrome that responded to treatment. It was not clear whether that was related to the gene therapy or would have happened anyway, so they're going to need to keep an eye on that. Um, they had a very high level of enzyme expression in the three patients that were treated, and they, in a, a separate study, but as part of the same uh, platform presentation, they noted that in the animals, they had excellent levels of uh, enzyme production in the heart and kidneys. They did not have enough data for any uh, evaluation of efficacy as with the other uh, gene therapy trials. Um, now, there were gene, there were treatment trials that were not um, gene therapy. The one that I have personally heard the most questions about is the pegylated enzyme and whether or not that would be useful and in an every four weeks rather than in every two weeks treatment. And that was presented. Uh, the four-week trial had no safety events that were different from the every two-week antibody treat or enzyme infusions, um, and those were essentially the same as treatment with the avail the enzymes that are currently available. Uh, Lysogb3 levels were stable with an average on treatment level of 22. These are patients who had classical Fabry disease, so we would expect the baseline Lysogb3 levels to be 50 to 100. Um, efficacy was not interpreted in this small study um, with a duration of only one year. Uh, but there were no changes in kidney or heart um, function in reported in the study. So the results are quite promising. The conclusion was that it appears to be safe and with comparable efficacy uh, to every two-week dosing. So I'm sure that there will be people interested in further follow-up of that. The FDA is currently, or they are currently preparing the package of uh, data for resubmission and review of the FDA for this drug. Um, it is not clear to me whether they will be ruling on the every four-week dosage um, with this next review or if that will just be uh, for every two-week dosing. So Fabry severity is also a hot topic. So FastX, FD Pro, and Satisfab were three different ways, and there were actually two, at least two more, one of which was a French study. Um, 
that are looking at ways of evaluating Fabry disease severity and whether or not current uh, interventions are impacting the severity of or the rate of progression of Fabry disease. The bottom line on this is that this is a, an important development for people with Fabry disease because up until now we have not had tools that were validated for application specifically to Fabry disease. Now we do have some of those tools. They are being used. We are still at a fairly early phase on that. This can be used both for obtaining approval in clinical trials, and they can hopefully be used as tools for monitoring individual disease progression. So I think this is something worth keeping a close eye on. Uh, biomarkers of heart disease. So they looked at VEGF, TGF beta, TGF alpha, INF gamma, and MCP1 in this study. Um, and noted that all of those were elevated. The VEGF, TGF beta, and INF gamma were also noted to be increased in patients who did not have obvious heart disease but did have um, significant renal disease. So they were thought to be important biomarkers of how active the Fabry disease is, but not necessarily tissue specific to cardiac. Um, they were thought to be more inflammatory biomarkers than, than cardiac specific. In either case, it is important for us to have monitors. Now, these markers are not specific to Fabry disease, meaning if people have heart disease, they go up. If they have active kidney disease, they go up. Even if the people being tested don't have Fabry disease. But if this correlates with the degree of control of the Fabry disease, when Fabry disease is the driver for the kidney and heart inflammation, that is still very useful and should be monitored. So this is, again, something to keep a close eye on and to learn about. I don't think at this point it is at a level where it's going to be widely distributed. Um, we'll need a couple more years to get to that point. Patient reported outcomes, there were at least five different presentations on this, and they asked some very simple questions, and this seems like it should have been done long, long ago, but it hasn't, at least not to the level of sophistication that this was. And the questions that they asked were, patients was, what do you care most about related to your Fabry disease? The novel finding that was reported consistently across all of the studies was that patients have strong opinions about what matters in Fabry disease and that they were fairly consistent. Um, in, based on those findings, there are at least two clinical trials in a planning stage, one of which should be launched in the next couple of months that are specifically focusing on patient reported outcomes and on the things that patients have reported as being most important to them, uh, which include um, pain, both abdominal and uh, peripheral nerve pain. The other thing that was noted and that I found kind of amusing was that adolescents had different priorities than adults, but they also had consistent sets of opinions. Uh, they tended to have higher importance on um, 
pain, fatigue, and things that are immediately interfering with function where the adults had a little bit higher priority on um, things like stage of heart disease, stage of kidney disease. So one of the specific um, talks that was on this was given by Daryl and Hughes, who's a true Febre expert um, based in England. Uh, and this starting at the top is the thing that was significantly important, but the least prioritized or thought to be the least severe. And that was Febre pain. The other things that were included in this study were stroke and heart disease and end-stage kidney disease. Um, I thought it was interesting that the daily symptoms, like not being able to sweat, having chronic um, neuropathic pain, and GI disturbances was ranked as more important than end stage kidney disease, but less important for uh, heart disease and, than heart disease and stroke. Or no, wait, it's opposite of that. End stage kidney disease was more important, but daily symptoms were more important on, than heart disease and stroke for a lot of people. But if you have the daily symptoms, and other things that obviously be, makes the burden of disease higher and needed to be addressed. Patient preferences for kinds of care. Patients want decreased burden of care, meaning less invasive and less time consumed to get care. Uh, they wanted Kidney or uh, treatments that would address GI disease and the severe fatigue uh, to be prioritized. There was a clear preference of oral therapy over IV therapy and of one time therapy over repeated therapy. None of that was surprising, but that was another um, presentation that, I, that looked at specific patient preferences. Um, another clinical study that was done looked at what happens when we give treatment for febre disease and looked at the same kinds of things as the in as the cardiac biomarkers study. Um, the specific ones they looked at were MIP1, beta, and VEGFA, and TNF-alpha. Um, these are all non-specific inflammatory biomarkers, and then there were two cardiac-specific uh, inflammatory biomarkers that were looked at that you can see on the slide. And what they found was with treatment, all of those things tend to uh, partially normalize, but they did not get them to completely normal levels. That is valuable and helpful, but it's not been done at a high enough level uh, to be considered, for those to be considered validated biomarkers. So those were the top line things. Uh, there were was a lot more uh, presented that we just don't have time to include today. Now I am open for any questions. Anybody that uh, may have questions can use the chat function to enter those or um, can also uh, use the raise your hand function, which is in the lower left corner. And we can try and get those questions addressed.
Um, one question that has come in, Dr. Hopkins, is what are the tests you would recommend for females every year? So I recommend that females be monitored with essentially the same um, monitoring that, that men do. Um, and for, an, for every year, uh, renal function studies, so you need uh, creatinine, uh, urine examples for proteinuria, and then a calculated glomerular filtration rate uh, for those. Um, and then I like to get lyso GB3, urine GB3, and um, other biomarkers. I get troponin and cystatin C. Troponin is a cardiac biomarker, cystatin C is a renal biomarker on my patients. Um, and then depending on the age of the patient and whether or not they have active known heart disease, I do cardiac imaging either every other year or every year in the adults. If I need more than annual imaging, then I defer the decisions on how frequently to do that to the cardiologist. Other things that um, I didn't have time to go into in this talk that we try to monitor regularly include hearing, um, which is a, an important one. I also like to get at least once a year um, an SF36 uh, brief pain inventory. And I am hoping that we will have the Fabre Pro or one of the other validated um, severity scales that's specific to Fabre disease available in the near future as well. For those uh, recommendations, would they apply the same for uh, adolescents as uh, in adults? Um, yes. Uh, well, no. So the cardiac uh, monitoring um, does not need to be that frequent in the adolescents. We, I do, um, as I mentioned before, in the uh, the, the standard recommendations are to get a baseline at the time of diagnosis, regardless of age, for cardiac monitoring. I start then um, at either 12 or 15, uh, depending on how symptomatic the, the patient is, um, with repeat cardiac imaging, and then I if it's normal, I wait five years to do it again, and then I go into the adult management or monitoring. For the kidney disease, I collect blood and uh, urine samples annually, even in the kids, both adolescents and pre-adolescent children. No, I am not seeing the. You can see the uh, the questions that that come in at the top right hand corner. The uh, I, I, got, I got it now. Okay. So the, um, there's a question on uh, that says that they're glad that women are now being recognized as not just carriers. It has taken a long time to get there. And they're asking a very important question, which is when will women be fully included in clinical trials? And that is an important question. It's also a difficult one. Um, to answer, the reason 
that women are underrepresented in the clinical trials currently is not that the companies don't recognize that they need to be treated. It's that the ways that we measure outcomes for clinical trials um, involve things like lysoGB3 and kidney function, like G change in GFR, which are much less reliable in women than men. Now, we are looking at ways of addressing that, and there are um, several of the companies that are planning gene therapy trials and that are planning uh, or that are continuing like the substrate inhibition molecules, the modified enzyme clinical trials are specifically designing things in ways that include women. Um, and that is, so it, it will be there. There is some debate about whether mixing men and women is appropriate because the pattern of disease is a little bit different between men and women. Um, so there's lots of details to work out, but it is actively being worked on, which is a really good thing. Um, women with skewed X inactivation um, have been include, included in some of the clinical trials. That's where the women who, uh, at least some of the women who have been included previously in small numbers have come from. Um, it is felt to be important. One, those women should be treated and monitored because the, the they tend to have um, severe involvement. But the second thing that's important is that those if you only include women with skewed X inactivation, you are only including women with an atypical presentation of, of Febre disease. And so that is not generalizable to all women with Febre disease. So we need to find ways of assessing outcomes in the clinical studies that are applicable to the general population of women with Febre disease and not just to the ones that have skewed X inactivation and present essentially like the men with Fabry disease. Are there any other questions at this point? Well, I think that um, at this point then, we have uh, actually gone over a little bit on time and uh, appear to have the questions answered. So I'd like to thank you very much, Dr. Hopkin, for your insights and presentation. As always, uh, fantastic. I am glad to do it. And hopefully at some point I will learn all of these platforms and be able to um, interact more efficiently. Hope everybody has a great day. Uh, thank you for including me in this. It helps me uh, to pay better attention in the meetings when I know I'm going to have to use this information uh, shortly after the meeting ends. And so this was very helpful for me. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, for speaking for Finn, everybody have a uh, wonderful day, evening, night, wherever you may be. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at future uh, presentations. So thank you. Bye-bye.